Okay, if this model works in India, you're in for trouble on your, you know, on who's going to, you know, make your vehicle uh, work for you. Next, what are the implications of all this disruption? We've seen that the life of companies, the average life of companies has dropped dramatically. In the year 1960, the average life of a company was 60 years. In 2015, the average life of an S&P 500 company is 12 years, 12. So companies are not even getting into teenagership. They're dying before 13, the average company. What happens to the life of CEOs? In the year 2000, 15 years ago, the average life of a CEO, or tenure of a CEO, was 10 years at the top. Today, the average tenure of a CEO is five years. Completely compressed in time, okay? Next, two other questions we need to ask when we talk of technology, information, etc. What happens to the concept of privacy? What happens to the concept of security in an internet of things when all the information is available to everybody? All these will be challenges for society. Privacy and safety will be a, security will be a huge disruption for us, okay? As more and more things go more and more digital. So in summary, for three points I want to make to you. Every business is an information business today. Peter Drucker said many, many years ago that we are in the you know, knowledge worker era. I think we've transcended that today. Every business wins on gleaning insights from information, number one. Number two, every business is going to be impacted by technology. There is not a single business which will not be impact impacted by technology. Any business you can think of, and one has to prepare for the disruption. If you don't prepare for a technology disruption, your business will not see the 13th year. And finally, digital disruption will be the order of the day. I've shown you the examples from the Wikipedias to the autonomous cars to the wearables to the Internet of Things and to the Uber car situation. Every single business will be digitally disrupted. Okay, so that's all I had to say, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. I think now we have time for Q&A, uh, about uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. Any questions you have for Vineet or for Amin or for myself, please, please feel free. Already two? Okay, I'll start with two. There's a question for you, Vineet. Our left brain education system is not teaching creativity. How do we create innovative citizens? By not attempting to do it. You know, I think this whole mindset of outsourcing uh, the job of creating uh, innovation to somebody else is, uh, is not right. Uh, I think our education system was based on the fact that we have 188 million children in our schooling system and if we have to standardize that schooling system, it is going to be an average education system. However, that constraint is going to remain. And irrespective of how much you want to wish, that is not going to change. And creativity is not going to come through the education system. Now, the basic raw material of a person who is coming into your organization is the same. High in aspiration, high in ambition, uh, very bright, uh, coming through an education system which is rote learning, that's all fine. Now the question is, how can you accelerate an environment within the organization for that person to learn uh, and innovate. Now let's look at in the Indian IT industry. When Indian IT industry started in the year 2000, uh, the number of computer science uh, engineers in our country were about 10,000 across all colleges. Uh, then it is, this industry decided that actually we need to demystify this whole coding business and we don't need computer science guys, we actually can do it with civil engineers also. And when they did that, now there are about 3 million engineers working in the Indian IT industry and most of them are not computer science engineers. And the reason was that the Indian IT industry came up with a six month uh, accelerated training program to begin with, and now it is down to 30 days, where you can convert a person who is from a very average engineering college where no teaching happens into a literate coder uh, in about 30 days time. Now they're going to struggle on how to, how to create that guy to be an innovator. So I think the responsibility of creating innovative workplace workers is not a uh, responsibility of the education system given the constraints we have in our country. It is the responsibility of the people who are going to benefit 
out of there being innovative and therefore they are the people who need to make that investment. That is, you have to make that investment rather than outsourcing and commenting on what others should do. Okay, next question. Next question, uh, I'm reading exactly as it is. Janab Amin, you're a pearl of Lahore. Okay, uh, we should think of a win-win position uh, for the industry progress. One is, can't we have a kilovolt line from Lahore to Amritsar? Second, can we have a ga gas plant between Iran, Pakistan and India? And third, cement export uh, between in India and Pakistan. Any comments? Um, as far as the Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline was concerned, um, that was how it was initially. And uh, then there was some deal between uh, the Indian government and the U.S. government, and then subsequently the uh, the sanctions also came about, uh, came uh, came down. So now that the sanctions are being lifted, uh, it's very much a possibility. And I would strongly, strongly suggest that uh, the Indian government should uh, seize on this opportunity, collaborate with with uh, with Iran. Iran is still very keen. Pakistan, I'm sure, will be very open. Because these are the ties that will create sustainable vested interests for peace. It will create constituencies within our countries uh, to really have some concrete uh, bridge building, not just society but also businesses. Uh, like uh, Sunil Munjal, he said yesterday, um, you know, that he went to Pakistan and he went and met the students and he said, what is the problem in our country? And quite frankly, it's not really as much as it's, it's absolutely exaggerated. Any statement coming from your minister over here, which is negative, gets magnified headlines in Pakistan. And we get this feeling that we're being arm twisted, da da da. Here I come, I speak, they say, we've not even read it, right? Similarly, something coming from Pakistan, it gets exaggerated over here. So we have these. Uh, you know, misperceptions that are absolutely magnified. And I think it is very important, any little opportunity also we get. The fact that we are here, we're talking, this is great. Some of our friends have come across, uh, by and large, they've been pleasantly surprised, right? Uh, I think, and as Mark Twain had said that travel is fatal to bigotry and, and prejudice. We need to go across. I, I come on the PIA flight, it's once a week or twice a week, half of the plane is empty. Hardly anyone from India comes to Pakistan and people are actually scared going, I would really, really encourage you guys to take that leap of faith. We will be on that other side, I assure you. Um, we, we would be happy to welcome all of you. Thank you. Okay, a question for Vineet. Innovation happens in developed countries uh, because of incentives from the government. Do you think Make in India strategy puts too much emphasis on manufacturing and very little emphasis on innovation? This question is to put me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> Are you so there, there are two aspects to it. Number one, innovation, disruptive innovation in the West happens out of incentives from the, by the government. I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, innovation doesn't happen. It, most of the innovation happens from school dropouts. So the American education system doesn't contribute to innovation. Uh, number two, innovation happens despite uh, all the constraints which the government puts, especially on privacy laws, on Google and Facebook, and you, you know that. Uh, coming to, uh, and therefore, uh, in India, I think the innovation is going to happen. Innovation has been happening. If you see Amul is very, very innovative. If you see Gulabi Gang, uh, is very innovative. If you see, you know, some of the innovations uh, are very, very interesting and they are all service innovation. They are not necessarily product innovation and therefore you are making the right point in terms of what innovation should look like in India. My personal view on manufacturing is the days of manufacturing are over. Uh, if you look at electronic manufacturing, we need dust-free environment. Uh, and, and that is very difficult in India. The second thing, I don't know how many of you are looking at the statistics, but a lot of manufacturing is moving back to U.S. And the reason a lot of manufacturing is moving back to U.S. is because there is significant automation coming into that manufacturing. With significant automation, the labor arbitrage advantage of global manufacturing in a country is going away. So unless you design a product, unless you own a, 
own a product and then manufacture the product, the manufacturing is not going to make sense. However, services is a very different thing. We have very large number of young people. And therefore, if you look at service sectors like tourism, healthcare, which is unexploited, uh, you know, IT, which should be further exploited and we should not lose the BPO to Philippines as we are already using it, I think we could create another five, six, ten million jobs in the services sector. And I wish there is a little more incentive, a little more emphasis in these new sectors like creating massive healthcare cities, uh, creating global infrastructure for healthcare cities, uh, more emphasis on that. I think that is easy to do. In manufacturing, we might as well go for large manufacturing like shipbuilding. If you look at the Koreans' uh, onslaught and Koreans' growth, that came from government incentives to car manufacture to shipbuilding. I think we need large manufacturing, some in defense, uh, some in shipbuilding. That I buy into because that has a huge component of human capital. Uh, the others, I'm not very sure because more and more automation is coming in. The competitive advantage in India doesn't exist. It is too difficult to do for too little return. And therefore, I agree with that sentiment that services is the way to go. Yeah, so next question for uh, Mr. Amin. Tough question and I asked him, would you like to take it? He said, I'm happy to take it. And uh, this question goes as follows. Can we call terrorism as disruptive innovation? Um, I do not call terrorism as an, as an innovation. It's been there since history of mankind. Um, how one views terrorism is different. As Reagan once said, one person's uh, freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. Uh, look, uh, I think terrorism is not an innovation, it's a non-state actor, right? Um, and I think there are other non-state actors, which is the civil society, all right? Uh, if there is a negative non-state actor, there's always a counterbalance by the good non-state actors, which is the civil society. All of us sitting in this room today are non-state actors, are part of the civil society. What are we doing about this, right? Just by blaming each other will not change our behavior, all right? All of us have our own stories to, to tell, and there are different viewpoints, all right? If one does not engage in them, one does not empathize with them, uh, Th things will not change on the ground, to be honest. And we as civil society should not, and I repeat, we should not be looking at marching orders from our respective governments, because peace is too precious to be left to just bureaucrats and politicians. If, if it was so much, if they could have done it, should have done it 60 years ago, or we would not have had two world wars in the last centuries or the centuries before that, where millions of people have died. The, 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 the nation state is an industrial age construct. We are sitting in this globalization, right? We as, civil, as global citizens should act as global citizens and we need to transcend borders. Uh, and so hence, I feel that uh, we need, as civil society, we need to step up. And we should create the spaces for our respective politicians to go and negotiate. I've yet to come across any politician in the last 15 years, I've been very active in track two, track one, uh, who say we don't want peace. Of course, everybody wants peace. The army generals want peace, the politicians want peace, but somehow they, they, are, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have restrictions, be it public opinions, uh, be it uh, stated positions, etc. We are the, we are, uh, you know, we as businessmen, what do we do? We are, by definition, problem solvers. We go day in, day in, uh, day out into our businesses and we solve problems. I cannot understand, we as civil society leaders, why can't we apply those skills for our two, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our two nations to, uh, to, just to build. I mean, I come to India, I feel much, much lighter over here than being in Pakistan. I get m a much better treatment here than in Pakistan. So, and, and similarly, some of you who have, who have come uh, to like Pakistan, you will feel the goodwill, uh, be it taxi driver, ya dukan wala ho gaya, everybody. It's not some statements people make, ha, bye bye, no. You actually feel it at the ground. And it's tragic, absolute tragic. It's been not only a leadership failure, but also more importantly, civil society failure 
that we have not been able to translate this groundswell of goodwill amongst the people uh, into concrete results. And it's absolute nonsense with these visa regimes, police reporting, city restrictions. I don't know which age we are living in. And I think we need to upgrade ourselves. And so for that, I would say, and also as, as far as terrorism is concerned, remember there were 60,000 Pakistanis that have died due to, due to like terrorism. If we were those extremists and if we were fine with it, 60,000 Pakistanis would not have died, right? Uh, so it, it's a very complicated situation and it's a long story, but, the, uh, but what is important is that we need to interact. And cricket, ka aap Pakistani khilari ko aap nahi khila rahe, you're boycotting them. Uh, arts hota hai, sometimes, you know, uh, hockey team nahi aari hai. These are the, are the ambassadors on both sides. If you, if you guys do not allow the civil societies to interact, I don't see politicians or bureaucrats really getting up one fine day and doing something which they've not done since past 60 years. Good. Okay. Last question before I hand over to Shogata, which is uh, Vineet, question for you. What do you think is the next big disruption in IT services? I think the, uh, so IT services is about $70 billion in export today and I think IT services is on the crossroad of irrelevance. Uh, and therefore, and the biggest disruption which is going to impact its existing revenue is the fact that A, software development is going into machines and therefore you're going to have automatic coding happening you have automatic, automatic healing happening of softwares which are going to fix themselves and therefore you're not going to need human beings who are going to fix the software. And the third is that the software is not going to exist on dedicated servers of the companies, they're going to be on the cloud and therefore all the maintenance revenues and management revenues are going to get disrupted. So Indian IT industry is at a crossroad as never before and they are going to get disrupted. So they disrupted IBM and Accenture of the world uh, and based on this, they created a fantastic growth industry. I think over the next five years, you will start seeing the semblance of a big challenge. And unless they re-innovate themselves and move away from this offshore, onshore cost arbitrage model uh, and move more and more people towards on-site and start looking at the digital disruption which is happening on the customer premise and start being uh, innovative, start being consulting, start being uh, those creative people who understand the business problem and use technology to solve the business problem. I am afraid I would say that the relevance of Indian IT industry is only going to head downwards and not upwards. So therefore, it's at a very interesting crossroads. And uh, I am not aware of it, you know, when, when did we as an industry face that uh, significant challenge in the industry. I still remember the manufacturing industry was very robust before the Chinese came in. And the Chinese completely took the manufacturing industry away from India, predominantly because the, you know, they played the same cost arbitrage game on India. I think the same game is not possible, but technology is going to disrupt this whole cost arbitrage business. So Indian IT has to up its game significantly, add significant more value, otherwise it will get disruptive. So it's less an opportunity for them, but definitely a threat for them, which, which hopefully will create the kind of disruptive innovation environment which Indian IT needs to disrupt and therefore constantly keep innovating and get to the $150 billion, which is what their dream is. Vineet, Amin, and Chef, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to conclude this fascinating session. It was fantastic listening to the distinguished speakers about disruptive innovations, growing influence on industries and firms. I thank the speakers, uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar, Mr. Vineet, and Ami for sharing their ext extraordinary insights and ideas on disruptive innovation. They have led market-changing innovations in their respective industries. Now, when it touched upon the, the various, uh, the four cycles of innovation, he did give a framework of innovation and what is disruptive innovation. But most important thing was that uh, he has come up with a bold statement that innovation is a skill you can learn. It is not a hostage to few. And he did 
go ahead with five habits of innovation which are defined as habits of aspiration. How big is your aspiration? Connecting the dots, that is the ability to connect the dots. Experimentation, hard work and to go on building hypotheses and testing the hypotheses. Diversity, reaching out to people. And he did talk about constraints. And understanding the constraints and addressing the constraints, and it gave a lot of live examples around it. So that was uh, Vinit's talk around innovation. I mean, gave a social, psychological, and a human angle to the whole concept of innovation. He did raise pertinent questions like uh, the art of imagination. And he did say that, is modernity leading to loss of imagination? Is technology making us junkies? Are we losing out on empathy as we modernize and get into an age of technology? What does innovation mean to us? And for him and his point of view, inclusive innovation is the way forward. And he concluded by saying that focus on rediscovering the old wisdom and how do we use the old wisdom in the present age and the present century.